In what's now one of my top five ever Lex Friedman interviews, Lex interviews Andre Karpathy, former AI lead at Tesla and perhaps soon to be AI lead at Tesla again. We will see and that will come up in the video. The two of them discuss everything from the universe, the nature of physics, <laughs> hacking the, the nature of physics to actually create quantum computers that do cool things, all the way to software 2.0, which is what I wanna talk about today. And software 2.0 not only explains what Andre was doing at Tesla and why he might return, but also how the future of software development and our lives in general might flow. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So yeah, the two of them get into a lot of stuff in this interview, and of course I will leave a link to the whole thing in the description. It's three and a half hours long. I highly recommend taking the time to, you know, sit down and absorb it all. It, you may have to do it in multiple chunks and that's okay, but I highly recommend it. Anyway, definitely watch the whole thing. What I wanna focus on today is about a 10 minute chunk between about an hour and six minutes and about an hour and 16 minutes. It's listed as software 2.0. I will bring in stuff from other parts of their channel chat as well as it pertains to what's going on. But before I start, I want to give a little primer about what software 1.0 is and software 2.0 is and why they're so different from each other. So first of all, software 1.0 is probably the stuff we're all familiar with. That would be programming in Python or C or C++ or COBOL or Fortran or whatever the heck you want to do. It's basically a deterministic form of programming that flows from the creativity of a human being. And what I mean by that is that a human being has to think to themselves, how can I create a mathematical algorithm or series of steps or recipe, something along those lines to make a computer do what I want it to do. So there's two very important impacts of this type of software. Number one, the human is completely responsible for coding the software, obviously, right? You have to conceptualize it, you have to think it, you have to type it into the computer, all of that kind of stuff. So the computer is just a hammer. It's just a tool that you're using. It doesn't really do anything anything without you motivating it to do it. And then the second consequence is it's highly deterministic, which means if you write an algorithm, the algorithm is very, very exact. It has, you know, it has a list of things that it does. It does them in order, it branches if it needs to, it does looping and things like that. But if you put in the same input, you're gonna get the same output. And yes, you can add random, random numbers and things like that to it, to affect it to some extent, but still in, in its own way, it's highly deterministic. And those two things are actually fantastic and they've served the computer science community well for gosh, getting on close to a hundred years now, right? From the 1940s on to right now, so about 80 years or so. This has served the computer science community very well, but the times they are a changing. And that of course brings us to software 2.0. And if Andre Karpathy is watching this, I think you might have to take a shot or maybe it's just if Elon mentions it. But anyway, <laughs> there seems to be a little game going on about software 2.0. But anyway, software 2.0 is not the same thing at all. Software 2.0 is actually based on neural network architectures. And what that means is it still requires coding. You still, a human being still has to have created Python and then they have to have created compilers and then they have to have created PyTorch and then they have to have created these really interesting architectures and things like that. So there's a human being at the base of this, but the software itself has become just a whole bunch of weights in a neural network architecture. And that has two really big consequences that are parallel to the other consequences of software 1.0. Number one is that the human is not responsible for all of this. You create the architecture. You're sort of like the, um, what was it? The deistic God that Ben Franklin and others believed in. He sort of started the universe and went ping it's like, you know, launched it and then it did its thing. So you create the architecture of this little micro universe that you're creating inside the computer. You make that, you set it up and then you give it a whole bunch of data and that architecture then tunes all of these little knobs or these little sliders or these little weights that you have inside this neural network architecture based on the data you have. And you don't know a priori what all of those numbers are going to be. That's the whole point is this thing trains itself and you don't have to. So as long as you pick a good architecture and humans are getting better and better at creating these architectures as long as you create a good architecture then what you can get out of it with the proper data and all of that is an amazingly powerful way of interacting with reality 
And then the second consequence of this is it's much less deterministic. All of those little weights, even tiny little adjustments by like 0.000 something of these weights can change the nature of what you get out of it. So you put in a picture of a dog and if it's not trained particularly well, you get dog out of it sometimes, but if you adjust these weights a little bit, you get cat or lizard or something else or nothing or I don't know, right? So it becomes much less deterministic when you use a neural network versus traditional coding. And then the third consequence, which really didn't have an antecedent in software 1.0 because you didn't need a ton of data. Often it would operate on data, but it didn't need data to understand itself. And that is that you need lots and lots and lots and lots of data. And that's the thing that modern neural network architectures depend on. And it's not just data, it's really good data. And that becomes a major effort in terms of how these things get trained and how they're developed. All right, so now that we've got that little primer out of the way, let's take a listen to what Andre and Lex have to say about this. So you've spoken a lot about the idea of software 2.0. Mm. Um, all good ideas become like cliches so quickly, like the terms, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of hilarious. Um, it's like, I think Eminem once said that like, if he gets annoyed by a song he's written very quickly, that means it's gonna be a big hit because mm -hmm. it's, it's too catchy. Mm. But uh, can you describe this idea and how your thinking about it has evolved over the months and years since since you coined it? Yeah. Yeah, so I had a blog post on Software 2.0, I think several years ago now. Um, and the reason I wrote that post is because I kept, I kind of saw something remarkable happening in like software development and how a lot of code was being transitioned to be written not in sort of like C++ and so on, but it's written in the weights of a neural net. Mm -hmm. Basically just saying that neural nets are taking over software, the realm of software, and um, taking more and more and more tasks. And at the time, I think not many people understood uh, this uh, deeply enough, that this is a big deal, this is a big transition. Uh, neural networks were seen as one of multiple classification algorithms you might use for your data set problem on Kaggle. Like, this is not that. This is a change in how we program computers. So it's worth reviewing history just a little bit here. So there have been a lot of attempts with artificial intelligence going all the way back to the 1950s on how to do artificial intelligence, how to do AI, including things like programming languages like Prolog, which is an amazingly cool programming language that nobody really uses anymore. And of course, very famously Lisp, which Prolog grew out of. But anyway, there were a lot of more traditional programming languages that you could build AI systems off of. And they actually had remarkable success over the you know, 30, 40, 50 years. Still were doing things like A-star and stuff like that that was developed in the 1960s. We have all of these classic algorithms that work really, really well. And people, according to Andre here, and I think according to me too, is that people were assuming that neural networks were just one more of these sort of classic AI classification systems and that they had their place, but that lots of other things had their place as well. And what Andre's saying here is this is a sea change. Neural networks are not just another way of classifying things using software 1.0. They're a whole new way of interacting with the world and creating software. And that has massive consequences to the future. And uh, I saw neural nets as uh, this is going to take over. Uh, the way we program computers is going to change. It's not going to be people writing a software in C++ or something like that and directly programming the software. It's going to be accumulating uh, training sets and data sets and crafting these objectives by which we train these neural nets. And at some point, there's going to be a compilation process from the data sets and the objective and the architecture specification into the binary, which is really just uh, the neural net, uh, you know, weights and the forward pass of the neural net. And then you can deploy that binary. And so I was talking about that sort of transition, and uh, that's what the post is about. And I saw this sort of play out in a lot of uh, fields, uh, you know, autopilot, autopilot being one of them, but also just uh, simple image classification. People thought originally you know, in the 80s and so on, that they would write the algorithm for detecting a dog in an image. And they had all these ideas about how the brain does it. And first we detect corners and then we detect lines and then we stitch them up. And they were like really going at it. They were like thinking about how they're gonna write the algorithm. And this is not the way you build it. <laughs> um, and there was a smooth transition where, okay, uh, first we thought we were gonna build everything. Then we were building the features uh, so like hog features and things like that, uh, that detect these little statistical patterns from image patches. And then there was a little bit of uh, learning on top of it, like a support vector machine or binary classifier uh, for cat versus dog and images on top of the features. So we wrote the features, but we trained 
the last layer, sort of the, the classifier. And then people are like, actually, let's not even design the features because we can't. Honestly, we're not very good at it. So let's also learn the features. And then you end up with basically a convolutional neural net where you're learning most of it. You're just specifying the architecture. And it, the architecture has tons of uh, fill in the blanks, which is all the knobs. And you let the optimization write most of it. So what Andre is talking about here is that, again, we're going back to software 1.0. It depends on the human brain. Human beings have to conceptualize what it is they're trying to do in incredibly specific ways. If you've ever programmed, you understand what I mean. You have you can't just tell the computer, you can't say like, go to the store and buy me some eggs or something. If you were going to do that in a classical system, you would have to specify down to minutely how each piece of the robot is going to move, or if it's a virtual world, how it's going to path plan and all of that and then what is an egg and how do I pick it up and how do I do all of those kind of things so that's an immense number of tasks that human beings are not very good at coding we don't understand how to translate our brains what we think into good code and it's a very very complicated and cumbersome task and very difficult so that's what he's talking about by building up all these features and handcrafting all of this stuff and then going to support vector machines and things like that to be able to do some learning on the top end of all of this so that's the software 1.0 way of doing things so the software 2.0 way is saying let's give this a neural network architecture let's devote our creativity to creating a very interesting and viable neural network architecture and then devote our creativity to get Getting a lot of data and data would be trips to the store, right? I, I video myself or something along those lines, going to the store, picking up eggs and coming home. And then thousands and millions of people do that also. And you feed that into the machine and you let the machine figure out what's important. Why is it important? How is it important? How do I act on it? And all of that kind of stuff. So all of that decision-making process and all of that sort of coding is being done by the computer itself. So what you can see is the importance has shifted from the human coding ability to the human's ability to figure out a good neural network architecture, and then a human's ability to be able to access, create a ton of useful data. And so this transition is happening across the industry everywhere. And uh, suddenly we end up with a ton of code that is written in neural net weights. And I was just pointing out that the analogy is actually pretty strong. And we have a lot of developer environments for software 1.0, like we have uh, IDEs, um, how you work with code, how you debug code, how do you, how do you run code, uh, how do you maintain code, we have GitHub. So I was trying to make those analogies in the new realm, like what is the GitHub of software 2.0? Turns out it's something that looks like hugging face right now. Uh, <laughs> you know. And so I think some people took it seriously and built cool companies. And uh, many people originally attacked the post. It actually was not well received when I wrote it. Mm. And I think maybe it has something to do with the title, but the post was not well received. And I think more people sort of have been coming around to it over time. So just to break in here quickly, an IDE is an integrated development environment. It's very, very useful for coding. So, uh, you know, Microsoft VS Code, Visual Studio Code, um, Apple's Xcode, things like that. Those types of environments make it much, much easier to do coding in version 1.0 of the software. And of course, it's critical to building out neural networks as well. You need that integrated development environment in order to be able to build out these really cool neural network architectures because it helps with coding and it helps with debugging et cetera, et cetera. So what Andre is arguing here is that we need an analogous thing for neural networks themselves. And that will actually be very cool when you can build an IDE for neural networks themselves, not for the code that builds the neural networks, that's gonna open it up to a lot more people who are not traditional programmers. And I think that that's going to be incredibly ideal. And I have some more thoughts on that I'm gonna talk about in just a minute, but I think it's important to think about what an IDE for a neural network would actually look like as opposed to an IDE for traditional coding. And by the way, hint, hint for a really interesting open source or company project would be building something like this. Yeah, so you were the director of AI at Tesla where I think this idea was really implemented at scale, which is how you have engineering teams doing software 2.0. So can you sort of linger on that idea of I think we're in the really early stages of everything you just said, which is like GitHub IDEs. Like how how do we build engineering teams that that work in software 2.0 systems? And and the, the the data collection and the data annotation, which is all part of that software 2.0. Like what do you think is the task of programming in software 2.0? Is it debugging in the space of hyperparameters or is it also debugging in the space of data? Yeah. The way by which you program 
the computer and influence its algorithm is not by writing the commands yourself. You're changing mostly the data set. Uh, you're changing the um, loss functions of like what the neural net is trying to do, how it's trying to predict things. But yeah, basically the data sets and the architectures of the neural net. So again, the three things you have to focus on are good data, clean data, and also labeling data, which is a very, very complicated and challenging task. The neural network architecture, which is the way that all of these things are built up. In other words, you have these layers and you have different types of neurons and everything that are in between all of those layers. And you have ways of skipping layers and you have ways of paying attention to other layers and all of this kind of stuff. So building out these architectures is critically important. And then, of course, it's the loss function. And the loss function is what I call, you know, the, the, the mean teacher that, that like spanks your hand when you do it wrong. So the neural network architecture attempts to do something. It attempts to find an answer to something. And when it's wrong, it's like smack. <laughs> you get smacked and you're told you've done it wrong and you're told how in a way. And then you back propagate that using partial derivatives and all of that going backwards to get a gradient to figure out how each of the individual weights in the entire giant neural network, which can be multiple billions of parameters, how each of those things is responsible for making that mistake. And that's why the loss function is really critical. And actually defining a good loss function for a complicated task is one of the hardest things to do with neural networks is trying to figure out exactly how you want to explain to the neural network that it's done wrong. That's a really, really important task and it shouldn't be underestimated. So in the case of the autopilot, a lot of the data sets had to do with, for example, detection of objects and lane line markings and traffic lights and so on. So you accumulate massive data sets of, here's an example, Here's the desired label, and then uh, here's roughly how the architect here's roughly what the algorithm should look like, and that's a convolutional neural net. So the specification of the architecture is like a hint as to what the algorithm should roughly look like, and then the fill in the blanks uh, process of optimization is uh, is the training process, and then you take your neural net that was trained, it gives all the right answers on your data set, and you deploy it. So you can almost think of neural networks as like a Mad Lib. If you remember those things that you have those blanks and you ask your friend what the, you know, give me a noun or give me an adjective or give me a color or something like that. And they tell you and you get these Mad Libs that make almost no sense because it's really funny. But what the neural network can do is when it creates these Mad Libs in a language model, then what you do is you say like, no, that wasn't very close at all. That's not what I was looking for. And it can actually refine that Mad Lib until it actually makes sense. And that's what Andre is talking about here. You keep refining and refining. You start off with really, really bad guesses, and then you refine and you refine and you refine until you get something that's really, really good. And when it's good, you deploy it. And whatever that is, that can be for language models. It can be for something like Dolly 2 or Imogen, where you're actually creating images from text. And it can also be for full self-driving. So there's, in that case, perhaps at all machine learning cases, there's a lot of tasks. So is coming up, formulating a task like uh, for a multi-headed neural network, is formulating a task part of the programming? Yeah, how very you, much so. How you break down a problem yeah. into a set of tasks. Yeah. I mean, on a high level, I would say, if you look at the software running in, in the autopilot, I gave a number of talks on this topic. I would say, originally, a lot of it was written in software 1.0. There's, imagine, lots of C++, all uh, right? And then, uh, gradually, there was a tiny neural net that was, for example, predicting, given a single image, is there like a traffic light or not, or is there a lane line marking or not? And this neural net didn't have uh, too much to do in, this, in the scope of the software. It was making tiny predictions on individual little image. And then the rest of the system stitched it up. So, okay, we're actually, we don't have just a single camera, we have eight cameras. We actually have eight cameras over time. And so what do you do with these predictions? How do you put them together? How do you do the fusion of all that information? And how do you act on it? All of that was written by humans um, in C++. And then we decided, okay, we don't actually want uh, to do all of that fusion in uh, C++ code because we're actually not good enough to write that algorithm. Mm -hmm. We want the neural nets to write the algorithm. And we want to port uh, all of that software into the 2.0 stack. Mm -hmm. And so then we actually had neural nets that now take all the eight camera images simultaneously and make predictions for all of that. Uh, so, um, and, and, it's, and actually they don't make predictions in the, in the space of images. They now make predictions directly in 3D. Mm -hmm. And actually, they don't uh, in three dimensions around the car. And now, actually, we don't um, manually fuse the predictions over t uh, in three D over time. We don't trust ourselves to write that tracker. So actually, we give the neural net uh, the information over time. So it takes these videos now and makes those predictions. Mm -hmm. And so you're sort of just like putting more and more power into the neural net, more and more processing. And at the end of it, the eventual sort of goal is to have most of the software potentially be 
in the 2.0 land um, because it works significantly better. Humans are just not very good at writing software, basically. So of course, Andre is talking about what I have been talking about as well, which is basically that human beings trying to solve the real world in code is not a good solution ultimately. So originally when full self-driving was attempted back in the 90s and then into the 2000s and even into the early days of what Tesla was doing, early days by 2015, 2016, that sort of range. At that point, you have a bunch of humans, really, really smart people trying to code up what an edge looks like or what does a red light look like or what does a curb look like or what does the actual road look like? And they're writing out hard-coded things that are saying, if it looks like this, if it does this, if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it is a duck, that kind of thing. But the problem is the real world is, is not nearly so constrained as these types of algorithms are. In other words, humans are like, oh, under these conditions, it looks like this and like this and like this. But what if it's raining outside? Or what if it's cloudy? Or what if the sun's coming straight into the camera? Or what if there's dirt on the windshield or things like that? This is just where human beings, we just can't do it. We can't can't, we're really good at operating in the real world. Obviously, we get around and we drive and we walk and all of that kind of stuff. We just can't translate that into code directly. And so what the neural network, the beauty of this software 2.0 neural network type of programming is, is that it can do it itself. If you give it enough good data, and you know, it's a lot of data and it's really, really complicated to do this, it can actually take video sequences, turn them into a video game, essentially, into a 3D world, into 3D graphics, and then identify all of the parts and navigate through that. And I've done a ton of videos on this. I'll leave a link to a playlist up at the top so you can check it out if you're interested. But anyway, I've done, you know, Andre has talked about this. I've done a lot of explaining videos on Andre. And so there's, there's a bunch of stuff that you can look at if you want to go down this rabbit hole more. But basically the idea is that software 2.0 is giving over our human control. We're kind of going like, we're not very good at this. Neural networks are way better at figuring this out on their own. And essentially it's the way that a human being learns, right? Too. It is analogous, but a baby learns how to to walk and how to talk and eventually how to drive a car and all of those kind of things without having to have somebody in there like programming up everything. And every human learns all of this stuff slightly differently at a slightly different speed, et cetera, et cetera. So it's critically important to understand the difference between a human coding something and we're not that good at doing it. We are really good. I mean, I don't wanna take anything away from humans. We're like remarkably clever apes and we're able to do this programming and stuff, but we're not that good to solve reality. And so that's where neural networks and software are point comes in. It goes from the kind of toy box problems that you've got with original types of things and that are relatively easily solved, even if it's massive amounts of code. An operating system, for example, or OBS software that I'm recording this on, really good stuff for software 1.0. But if you're trying to solve full self-driving or creativity, like making art of making a monkey drive around on a tricycle or something like that, you know, generate a picture of that, that's where neural networks come in. They, they excel at learning how to do complicated real world things. So the prediction is space, uh, happening in this like 4D land yeah. with three-dimensional world over time. Yeah. How do you do annotation in that world? What what, what have you, as, so, so data annotation, whether it's self-supervised or manual by humans is, um, is, a, is a big part of this software yeah. 2.0 world. Right. I would say by far in the industry, if you're like talking about the industry and how what is the technology of what we have available? Everything is supervised learning. So you need a data sets of input, desired output, and you need lots of it. And um, there are three properties of it that you need. You need it to be very large. You need it to be accurate, no mistakes. And you need it to be diverse. You don't want to uh, just have a lot of correct examples of one thing. You need to really cover the space of possibility as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And the more you can cover the space of possible inputs, the better the algorithm will work at the end. And so now we're on to data. Data is an absolutely crucial element of doing neural networks. That's sort of what you're giving over. You know, you're changing from doing the coding and the, the exact coding and all of that sort of tweaking to collecting data. We're turning into collectors, like museum collectors, as opposed to people who do the paintings themselves. I guess that might be a reasonable analogy. So, so you know, the original coding software 1.0 is you've got the artist painting the painting and doing an absolutely beautiful masterwork. And what we're doing instead now is we're turning into curators. We're becoming museum collectors. So we're like, how many millions of paintings can we fit inside of this building? And if we fit enough in here, we're going to have 
the best art museum, right? In other words, what we can do is we can solve what is a red light and how does a red light look under all of these different lighting conditions and if it's turned sideways versus right side up and all of those kinds of things. So you solve these problems now through massive, massive data and you need clean data, you need a ton of data, and you also need diverse data. Diverse data is very, very important. You can't just train on one light, right? You can't, you can't go to Chicago and train only on the red lights in Chicago. You need to know what they look like in different areas because in some parts of the United States, they're turned sideways. In other parts of the world, they might be in different places. They might be hung on like lamp thingies like this that are hanging out over part of the road, or they might be strung up over the middle of the road. So there's many, many, many different types of red lights. If we just take that particular instance. And what you have to have is as many different examples of that as possible. And then the cool part is that what you can do is you can bootstrap eventually. If you discover you can handle all of the lights in the United States, except for in Tulsa, Oklahoma, for some reason, I don't know why that would be the case. But anyway, hypothetically, let's just say what you can do is collect a ton of data from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then you can refine the network so that it works better and better and better on those particular lights, hopefully without making the rest of it perform worse. That's always the balancing act is it could get worse with the other types of lights that you've already got and that you work well with as it learns how to do this. But if you can do the balancing act right, you can add more data where you need it and you can therefore bootstrap yourself and get better and better at these predictions. Now, once you have really good data sets that you're collecting, curating, um, and cleaning, you can train uh, your neural net um, on top of that. So a lot of the work goes into cleaning those data sets. Now, as you pointed out, it's probably, it could be the question is, how do you achieve a ton of, uh, if you want to basically predict in 3D, you need data in 3D to back that up. Mm -hmm. So in this video, we have eight videos coming from all the cameras of the system. And uh, this is what they saw. And this is the truth of what actually was around. There was this car, there was this car, this car. These are the lane line markings. This is the geometry of the road. There's a traffic light in this three-dimensional position. You need the ground truth. Um, and so the big question that the team was solving, of course, is how do you how do you arrive at that ground truth? Because once you have a million of it and it's large, clean, and diverse, then training a neural net on it works extremely well, and you can mm -hmm. ship that into the car. And uh, so there's many mechanisms by which we collected that uh, training data. Uh, you can always go for human annotation. You can go for simulation as a source of ground truth. You can also go for what we call the offline tracker um, that we've spoken about at the AI day and so on. Mm -hmm which is basically an automatic reconstruction process for taking those videos and uh, recovering the three-dimensional sort of reality of what was around that car. So basically think of doing like a three-dimensional reconstruction as an offline thing, and then uh, understanding that, okay, there's 10 seconds of video, this is what we saw, and therefore here's all the lane lines, cars, and so on. And then once you have that annotation, you can train your neural net to imitate it. After this point, Andre and Lex move on to human annotation and stuff, but I think it's worth at least talking about the offline tracker very briefly. The offline tracker is something where what you can do is instead of having to do predictions in real time where you're very, very restricted, right? You have milliseconds to make decisions about what to do next in the vehicle. What you can do is you can have much, much larger neural networks that don't even fit into a car that can take as long as they want to to really go through a scene and figure out where everything is. And from that, you can create a ground truth. And what you can do from that is you can move from human annotation, which is very, very slow and cumbersome because humans, you know, for <laughs> we're excellent, but we are very, very slow compared to a computer. You can go from that to a computer that can do this very, very quickly once you train a whole other set of neural networks to be able to do that type of annotation work. So that is really, really critical. And that's where like Dojo and these big supercomputer clusters really come into their own. What you're trying to do is create like a meta network that allows allows it to understand the actual ground truth of what a car is doing. So then you train your car's neural network architecture based on this ground truth that you're getting from this much larger, more complex, more slow to run neural network that's actually working on things. And if you've heard people talking about NERFs or neural radiance fields recently with Tesla and their full self-driving, that's one of the things that they're actually working on is creating a ground truth using NERFs. All right, so that was the section where Andre and Lex talk about software 2.0. Why do I think this indicates why Andre left and why he might also return to Tesla? And by the way, later in this interview, he actually does say that he's open to returning to Tesla, specifically for Optimus and for the Tesla bot and for working on that. He actually talks about how Tesla bot currently is running full self-driving. It's basically a car on two legs and how that needs to be changed. So I believe the reason why Andre decided to take a break from Tesla 
is that he's really a researcher. He's not an implementation engineer. He wants to discover the cool new things. And where Tesla is right now with full self-driving is they're on implementation. They're like, how do you track down all those nines? How do you change, tweak the architecture a little bit to make it work? All of that. I think once Andre got to the point where he was like, oh, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I know that this will actually work at this point. It became much less interesting to him. He's really more of a pure research kind of guy, right? So he was like, oh, this is all just implementation and working out all the details and stuff. Somebody else can handle this. The reason why he might return to Tesla then is obviously because he would have an interest in working at that fundamental research level again in terms of recreating the full self-driving networks, whatever they're going to call this, in Optimus itself and recreating that for a robot rather than stealing what they've got from full self-driving and just kind of porting it directly into Optimus. So right now it works really well. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from what that is, but it is an interesting question as to what they can do to really, really optimize the networks, the data, the loss functions, et cetera, for Optimus itself. And I think that would be intriguing enough to Andre to get him back to Tesla again. So we will have to wait and see how that all works. But in the meantime, this interview is fantastic. This was just a tiny little section and you can see I spent a long time discussing just that one section. So again, I highly recommend watching the entire interview. And in the meantime, I hope this helps explain why software 2.0 is so important to the future of Tesla, but also to the future of software in general, if people really take this on. All right, I hope you found this episode fun and interesting and thought-provoking. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. I love the conversations and you really do help me to travel and do all of that other stuff. So I really do truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. And of course, if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have TeslaBot T t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells, all of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And one other thing for my Patreon patrons and anybody else who's in the Florida area, I'm going to be down at TeslaCon Florida on October 21st and 22nd. So definitely come say hi to me if you're in the area. And finally, don't forget, we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.